I am passionate about this and I know, so we really share that passion. <laughs> I think everybody in the room really shares that passion for, uh, you know, STEM outreach, for volunteering, um, for uh, service learning and all of the things that, that you are doing so well in this Viterbi Impact Program. Um, I'm really impressed with the program. I, I must admit I wasn't completely aware of it, um, although I do work with many student orgs, um, I wasn't completely aware of it, and I'm so glad to know more about it and to be able to contribute here and, and to, be a, to be a part of it. So, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you also to VASE. Thank you to the K-12 through STEM Center, all good friends of mine, and, and Myra for that kind intro and especially to the students gathered here i'm trying to catch everybody's name i would love to meet everybody personally um, today but thank you for everything that you are doing um, and i just want to really really come on strong with that with that gratitude because it, it is uh, such a, obviously we know, such an unusual situation and such an unusual time. I do think it has a lot of benefits and I'll be talking a little bit more about why I think that and how I can maybe share that with you. Um, but in, in the virtual environment and, and, and how you're extending yourselves and continuing to extend yourselves and really uh, stretching um, in that is, is just remarkable and and you really are kind of the standard bearers of who we are here at the Viterbi School and you represent us just incredibly well so thank you um, thank you all all right so I am gonna talk a little bit about how to explain STEM concepts in non STEM terms and I'll just give you a little hint right off the bat it's through people, <laughs> okay? Uh, people are the connectors. And we, we often think of STEM as a sort of a remote, um, abstracted kind of fields and maybe inaccessible. We know that they're perceived as inaccessible to many of our underserved populations, maybe even ourselves, um, but when you explain STEM concepts in non-STEM terms, I want to help you think about it in terms of STEM as being a social endeavor and a human endeavor and how uh, that can really come to bear on, you know, how you approach uh, explaining STEM to other people and how it can really enliven you know, um, all the, this integrated set of fields. Um, and I'm gonna introduce a little bit different way of communicating STEM concepts for more impact, for kind of maximum impact, and that's gonna be through a transformative approach. So that might be a new word for you, but I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, during this, this uh, presentation so that you know uh, you have a few kind of uh, keys to, to maybe making that happen. Okay, so I teach, I, I forgot to tell you what I actually do here. Um, I, teach, <laughs> I teach in the engineering writing program at the Viterbi School. I have been teaching there for 21 years. I love it, obviously, and uh, helping young people improve my improve their lives and succeed in their endeavors is my is my kind of my purpose, and and my mission. So that that's what I do, and that's why I also am very involved in STEM outreach, uh, STEM uh, service learning in the classroom. I have a big project that does that and particularly supporting um, student orgs and, and, and student affairs type things, because that's, uh, those are additional ways that I can help students. Okay, um, so next slide, if you don't mind. Um, this is, again, a little bit of a lengthier introduction. I like your little icon, by the way, Myra Viterbi Impact. I think that's really neat. Um, because of this, yeah, the step up is, is neat, so I put it here. Um, but volunteering is a part of 
our character at the school. You know this, and we know this, and it, it, it's part of who we are as a school. And our dean often talks about these this element of character, you know, in in Viterbi. And in fact, we hear about it quite a bit um, in in the overall messaging. And this is one way that we're sort of enacting it and applying it in in real life. Um, you know, sharing knowledge and demystifying concepts, of course, is going to help build STEM competence. Competence being um, knowledge, skills, uh, you know, ability to do things, uh, to apply your learning, uh, achieving results, that, that kind of thing. Um, so we, that's something that we value, obviously, is sharing knowledge and demystifying concepts. I think it's very important to do so for non-STEM audiences. Things can, can be caught up in a mystique uh, that, or a, a, a sort of a mystifying kind of, you know, maze that, that it just doesn't have to be um, it, it shared that way. Um, so with this combination of character and competence, um, we do generate trust. And that's something that's very important to us is to, you know, have an impact on the com community and have this kind of uh, extending trust and building trust with others, you know, in, in multiple communities and in, in multiple kind of contexts. So trust actually, um, I think as the Dean thinks of it or conceives of it, it, it actually is a quantitative, it's quant it can be measured quantitatively and it can have a real network effect. You know, if you extend trust to somebody, then maybe they'll extend trust back to you. If you can connect with people, then it fosters a, a, and, and spreads sort of a broader uh, trust within a community. So the, the impact is very, very strong of kind of volunteering, showing who we are, sharing our character, who we are, but also sharing competence, knowledge, skills, concepts. Okay, and th those kind of add up to a big impact. All right, any questions so far? Stop me or, or, or jump in, please. Okay, Myra, we'll keep going with the next slide. Um, all right, so this starts with a little bit of a story. Um, I, I said from the get-go that connecting with people is a real key to STEM, and that's in a way an unconventional idea. We, we don't normally associate people with STEM fields. We think of it as more, uh, you know, well, math is sort of abstract. It maybe reflects of natural law or science is natural laws. And in, in some ways, uh, STEM fields, technology may be inaccessible for various reasons. Um, but, but STEM endeavors really are human endeavors and they really are social endeavors. So if you actually start to think about it this way, it'll help you uh, communicate concepts to people a little bit more readily. Um, I studied, you can see all these books behind me. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I studied literature and literature was very much an individual endeavor. It's a human endeavor, but it was very much like people would write books kind of in isolation and, you know, it was just them sort of speaking. Um, and it, it, STEM is, is quite different. It's, it's very social, actually. It's very, very social. So I really want to highlight that today and, and how the connecting with people is really key to, to sharing it. Um, I had a wonderful student last fall pre-pandemic last fall named Zaman Pasha. And I'm actually going to quote him here because I thought he said the most insightful thing at an opportune time. And it really helped to kind of shift my the way that I was running my current service learning project um, in, in my own classroom. And it gave me a kind of a, a, a real takeaway, a real insight 
and and part is part of uh, what's informing you know what I'm what I'm teaching you today, and so I'll tell you what happened. Um, we were about to present my students were about to present their final projects to um, uh, our community partner, which is a, an underserved uh, school in the community, like really close to campus at USC. And that day, we were supposed to be going there to, no, actually, we had gone to their site during the course of the semester, during the course of the project, and, the, and then the kids, they were about, they were about maybe 10 third graders, and their teacher and their principal were going to be coming to USC to attend live their final presentations, right? Um, that was, you know, a STEM outreach project presentation. And so, about 10 minutes, we were sitting there at the beginning of class, and Zaman was, was in the class, and about 10 minutes before start time, you know, before we, they were gonna walk in, the principal called me and said, we're having a problem, we cannot get there. And I'm like, oh gosh, here it is, the last day of class, all my students have worked so hard, you know, they, I feel terrible because they're not that far far away, but we're somehow disconnected. You know, we're, we're like stranded in this situation. And I was like, all is lost, right? <laughs> and, and so uh, one of my engineering students, Zaman, said, wait a second, wait a second, Professor Weiss, it, people just want to connect. And I'm like, what? At that point, just open to anything. I'm like, yeah, I know that. What does that have to do with the crisis that's occurring right now? And he goes, let's just Zoom with them. And so I thought, okay, I've Zoomed before, not all day, every day, like we do now. <laughs> but I've Zoomed before. Let me see if I can get this going. So with my own experience on a bunch of engineering students in the room, we were able to get them up and running with Zoom and to get the whole thing set up. And my students proceeded to deliver their presentations to these young children that they were working with, they were collaborating with over Zoom. And by the end of that class, I thought, you know, this is really interesting. People just want to connect, you know? And my students were sort of very animated. They were very engaging. You know, young people are very visual. Um, young people, the younger kids, and, and you, people like you all used to screens being used well. And it just worked great. And I, it gave me the idea that I would then start to do this final presentation over Zoom. And this was all before the pandemic. And so I kept that with me and really tried to keep it, you know, use that, um, what Saman said, as, as a real uh, way to connect with people virtually because it was successful in that, in that situation. So again, connection with others is key to learning STEM concepts. If you think about it, when, you're, when you are problem solving, you have to connect with others. You need a diversity of ideas. You need a lot of different points of view, right? Um, if you are, uh, math is very creative. Creativity is often fostered in collaboration with others. Sometimes it's highly individuated as well, but it's usually informed by, by others. Um, you know, uh, STEM concepts generally are, are enacted in connection with others. So in your volunteering, in your um, sort of outreach, emphasizing connection with people over content, I think is a really good strategy at this time. Okay, the virtual environment does create new opportunities for connecting communities. And sometimes just establishing that connection will open up different ways to, to collaborate, to create together, um, to problem solve, and to sort of uh, ask important questions. Okay, think critically and, and things like that. 
All right, so connecting with people is key. Um, any questions so far? Everybody with me? All right, Myra, I'll, I'll jump to the next slide if you've got that handy. Thank you so much. All right, so this is just kind of a recap of core STEM, what we think of as STEM concepts. So I'll just reinforce those here, but scientific inquiry, um, obviously the process of science uh, uh, research, um, investigation, um, you know, finding answers. I'm sorry, I'm gonna close this window, excuse me. <laughs> Zoom, right? Something that happens. But scientific inquiry um, is, is one of our core kind of STEM concepts. And I've translated these different concepts into what I would call social, socio-technical skills, okay? So when, you're, when you are asking questions, when you are kind of initiating scientific inquiry, they all, all inquiry, of course, is questions. That's just a fancy word for questions. So people are inquisitive by nature, especially young people. So when they start to question, you want to foster questioning. That, that is the, the, one of the keys to scientific, it is, it is the essence of the scientific process. And when somebody is asking a question, it starts a dialogue, right? So then maybe, maybe you're, the, you're teaching or you're volunteering and you want to engage them in dialogue. You know, you don't just answer the question and necessarily shut it down. It doesn't end there because science is involves an entire process of inquiry. And in, in fact, you ask a question, maybe you, you, you make a little bit of a progress toward an answer and then another question emerges and on and on and on. And that is the scientific process. So dialoguing, and uh, ants and fostering inquiry and questions in general involve communication. So already you've got people, you've got multiple people, you know, um, and, and this, this can help model and practice uh, a, a key sort of STEM concept of inquiry, scientific inquiry. Okay, um, problem solving, obviously, Problem solving is key to STEM. We're trying to solve math problems, trying to solve, you know, even if you start to think of it in terms of uh, these gigantic sort of grand challenges type problems, they're, they're even called wicked problems. And that's because humans are involved. They're, they're complex beyond any kind of, uh, you know, answer that's readily available or obvious. Um, they're, they're complex, meaning many different people are affected in many different ways by a, a problem. Um, so problem solving absolutely calls upon the socio social skill of collaboration or working with other people. We need a diversity of ideas. We need a diversity of perspectives. We need um, uh, multiple sort of divergent thinking, even multiple viewpoints, because that will help us sort of together in collaboration crack, you know, some of these big complex problems, which we, we, we see almost routinely. You know, we, we've identified them through grand challenges, but we've, we see them routinely. They, they just tend to emerge all the time and then kind of snowball. Okay, mathematical thinking. Now, this is a, a, a super interesting concept. Um, you know, um, whether you sort of excel at math early or not, um, you can always acquire it. You can always learn it. But I'm going to teach you, a, or I'm going to share with you a couple of ways to, uh, to highlight the creativity 
in math and mathematical thinking. And that might help some people who are struggling or who have not been exposed to STEM concepts. You know, they, they, they're not used to the, to, the, to the way we talk about certain subjects and mathematical thinking may in and of itself be a remote kind of esoteric concept. So linking mathematical thinking to creativity and to art specifically, which it is, mathematical thinking is highly creative, sounds strange, but it, but it's true, um, then that might open a door for people who, you know, feel they are having difficulty accessing math or grasping it or, you know, moving forward in it, which as my friend Sarah and my other friends at K through 12 STEM Center are telling me that that's a big problem. So they, they have the data and they have the research to support that. So this might give you a way out in terms of uh, sharing mathematical thinking or communicating about mathematical thinking. And then finally, technological literacy. Um, this is considered another kind of core uh, STEM concept. And literacy means going beyond just being able to use a technology. Um, I would say the difference between engineering and technology is really that technology is 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 sort of a, a an instrument or a device or something material that um, has a, has a purpose, a human sort of purpose or impact assigned to it, you know. And so, so when we when we become technologically literate, we're not just learning how to use something that somebody else has made. Um, we're 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 actually seeing the the object or the device as uh, almost objectively. You know, I use, I use the term critical thinking here because that's the, the social or tech, socio-technical skill. That's what it's called. But I think of it more as thinking objectively. You know, being able to look at something and say, how am I interacting with this? Like, how is this impacting my life? Um, you know, how is it maybe impacting other people's lives differently than it's impacting mine? And you start to look at it almost like, like you would have a, an object of art or a sculpture, you know, where you're, you're, you're not necessarily criticizing it because there's no reason to criticize it. You're just looking at it objectively and you have that perspective on it. Okay. So these are just ways of thinking of our these core concepts, but thinking of them in terms of people and how we're interacting with people all the time through STEM, okay? Through communication, collaboration, creativity, and, and critical thinking. We're doing that socially. We're doing that in concert with other people, and that's something that is very special about, about STEM. Okay, any questions so far? Is this making sense, folks? All right, all right, good. Thank you, Myra. Yeah, I'll take the next one. So I want to introduce a little bit of a different way of thinking about this, and I'm just going to touch on it. But I'm, what I'm giving you here is a transformative approach to STEM, to communicating STEM, to uh, explaining STEM, to sharing STEM. Um, we all know, because you're in the field, and we know because we're in the field too, that STEM learning can literally transform lives and uh, career paths or trajectories. Um, it's, it's our belief that it's for the better, um, but this is obviously also a, um, sort of a social and an economic mandate. We've had a lot of effort put into STEM learning and education for the last decade or two. It's been a high priority um, because we sort of, as a, as a group, um, I think most countries in the world feel this way, um, that STEM learning can really um, affect our overall society for the better and can transform individual people's lives. So service learning and volunteering, you all know this because you're out there doing it. 
um, it's that it can give you a life transformative experience. So what I mean by transformative is it has impact beyond the the kind of obvious, um, you know, I felt fulfilled that I did that or I felt satisfied. It can set up a, a kind of um, um, uh, multiple uh, I'll use that that uh, expression network effects again, but it can set up sort of multiple out multiple benefits and outcomes for for you and for the people that you are interacting with. Okay, that's what it means when something is transformative. It's it sort of changes the nature of it. Okay, changes the nature of it. Um, so transformative learning experiences improve well-being, and these are three sort of key aspects of well-being, and this has been identified in many sources. The one that I uh, have used here is the Coalition for Life Transformative Education. Okay, I can make that link live for you all when I send Myra the, the, the final PowerPoint. But Three key aspects of well being are identity, purpose, and agency. Okay, so identity is just a sense of who you are um, and your place in the world. That's what they, we mean by identity. Purpose is sort of the why, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. It, you you want to always have a larger purpose. I'm volunteering because I want to uh, impact people's lives, you know, for the better. Um, that or or maybe I want to fulfill, you know, my my um, desire to connect with people or something like that. You always have some kind of why behind your action. And when you have purpose behind your action, it, it, you, this is incredibly helpful in life. It's incredibly inspiring and you, you're motivated. You know, it keeps, it keeps you kind of, keeps your motivation sustained and sustainable. It's, you have a sense of purpose. And this is a real key to well being. And then finally, agency. Agency is, is a little bit of, it sounds a little bit of a, a more difficult term, but it basically just means the ca capacity to act almost like upon your own free will, like to be able to make choices and to be able to make choices independently um, or independent of certain structural constraints. And by structural constraints, I mean things like that we struggle with, with, with people that we're helping and people that we're volunteering that they struggle with. Um, we all, all struggle with to a certain extent, but things like, um, things like your gender, your, I, you know, your, your, maybe your identity is perceived by others, um, your uh, socioeconomic status, you know, things like that. So agency is your ability to kind of act um, without con being constrained by those things. You know, you don't necessarily, uh, it, it means you're, you're not necessarily a, a subject to your culture or your, you know, your something that has, has, is structural and something that you really can't do anything about. Okay, so that's what a sense of agency is. I know I'm giving you a lot of concepts here, but I'm just trying to trying to give it a little bit of a new approach um, to help you to help you um, enliven it in your communication and in your explanation. Okay, questions so far? Everybody makes sense, everybody? All right. Okay, Myra, we'll go to the next. All right, so I've applied it here specifically to generating STEM identity, which is something that Sarah Thomas taught me about and something I more or less knew to be true, but have, have discovered a lot of research about building STEM identity in people who have not been exposed to, to STEM concepts before. Um, and this is, again, to tie into this sense of well-being, which is which um, identity and um, purpose and agency are integral to. So as humans, we are natural problem solvers. That's what we're engaged in a lot of our time. 
And young people are particularly curious and inquisitive. We know this, right? You're very inquisitive. Um, hopefully you still are and always will be. Um, I have two young kids. They're probably calling on the phone right now, seeing, playing around, right? And they're, what, what do you do? They're very inquisitive. And that's something that should never go away. You know, you want to, uh, this, this is part of scientific inquiry. You know, young people are little scientists. This is what's, it starts early. It starts from the beginning. It doesn't start with STEM education. It starts early. But in STEM education and in sharing STEM concepts and learning, we want to foster that curiosity and we don't want to shut it down. You know, we want to keep that inquiry going. Young people are naturally curious and inquisitive. Okay, so teaching math and science through inquiry is, a, is, is very, very effective. You know, letting, letting maybe the, um, the, the, the person who hasn't been exposed to STEM before, ask the question, and then following through on that question, not shutting it down, following through. And then problem solving something in context. You know, something in, uh, maybe it's a problem that's just happening in your immediate vicinity. Oh, if there's a problem in the room, there's, there's some noise, or whatever it is that you're trying to do, contextualize it. You know, so it becomes a real live problem. And by problem solving, the, the, you know, learners are directly engaged in the process. They're not learning about somebody else solving problems. They are solving a problem that they, in fact, have identified. Okay, and that's a very empowering thing. So inquiry and contextual problem solving help generate STEM identity because you're learning it by doing it. You're not learning about it. It's not an idea, right? And the studies have shown that this is much, much more effective than memorizing content. This is a very unconventional approach. We normally think of building blocks or incremental uh, building blocks in education. You're going to learn this first, and especially in math. Then you're going to learn this. Then you're going to learn this. Later, you'll learn how to apply it to big stuff. But at that point, you, you've already maybe have lost the, the inquiry, okay, um, or the opportunity to solve problems contextually. Um, so it's something to just keep in mind in terms of people growing, built, being able to grow STEM identity. Students can learn like scientists and mathematicians by asking questions and actively engaging in the design process. This was just recently published by a professor in, um, in Pennsylvania named uh, uh, Dr. Cormus. And he, I was shocked at it because um, I didn't think that it had to be studied, but he basically showed how, you know, he's been teaching teachers um, or implementing this into education programs, teaching teachers how to, how to do this instead of having their students memorize, just having them actively engage in problem solving, okay, and in the design process. That's just designing a solution, okay, that's, that's what that means. And placing students in these roles and having them stay in those roles grows their STEM identity because they're not adopting somebody else's role. They're not seeing somebody else play the role. They are playing the role themselves and they learn by doing. All right, makes sense, everybody? Thank you, Myra. I wanna show you all a great exemplar of somebody who is doing this. So he is one of our very own alums. And have you all heard of Mark Roper? <laughs> have you seen his YouTube channel or have you, have you watched any of his, his shows? Okay, you, you all have got to check this out. If, if I had a longer workshop today, we would sit here and watch Squirrel Ninja Obstacle Course and, and laugh about it. 
Okay, but this guy, I'm not surprised. He's a great guy. He came from USC Viterbi. He went to, he got a master's degree here. And he does the, he, he's a huge following. And so this is how he teed up. I think this is so fascinating. That's why I put it at the top of the top of the slide here. This is how he teed up this episode, Squirrel Ninja Obstacle Course. Squir and literally, this is in his words. Squirrels were stealing my bird seed, okay? That's the problem. Squirrels were stealing my bird seed. That's just a real problem, right? Everyday life. So I solved the problem through mechanical engineering, okay? So it's so interesting because we don't really know how he's going to solve the problem. It's, we don't really know that. And it's actually unclear during the course of the video whether he is going to be able to solve the problem or not. You know, he's not lecturing about it. He's, he's learning by doing. He doesn't know the answer himself, but he's showing the learning process. So he begins each, this is kind of, I've watched a bunch of the episodes. My, my kids have caught on to him and he's a real, he, they're real fans in the house. But he, he begins each episode, I've kind of broken it down for you, with an everyday problem that has no clear solution. It's very contextual. You know, it's something that's going on in his particular uh, green space. It, it's something that, I mean, maybe we don't have squirrels like this. He lives somewhere in the Midwest. Maybe we don't have squirrels like this in California. I mean, you know, it's very contextual, very specific. And there's no obvious solution. There's no clear solution. As a matter of fact, he spends about a third of each episode carving out the problem more specifically. So the problem isn't just the squirrels are eating the bird food. The problem becomes, I tried this from Amazon. It said it was squirrel proof. It didn't work. This is why it didn't work. And it goes on and on and on. So about a third of each episode is actually, is occupied with inquiry. You know, what, what is the problem? Like we're just trying to get a handle on the problem itself, right? Then, each episode becomes essentially a learning journey, you know, through active problem solving. He gets his buddies and they're in a team and they just sit there. Or maybe it's just him. A lot of times it's just him and his wife or his kids. And they're just trying to figure it out, you know, but they're, it's live and they're figuring it out. Now we know because it's episodic and because it's on a channel, we know that there will be a solution at some point you know, they will fix this squirrel problem. But it's much more about the process, you know, than it is about this is the right way to solve the squirrel problem. You know, because again, it's a contextual problem. And so the solution becomes subordinate to the process itself. And that is the social aspect of STEM. You know, it's, it's not about giving the answer. I know the answer, you don't, so I'm, now I'm going to tell you. It's not about that. It's about engaging learners in the process of problem solving. And then the problem solving process is their own. You know, it's something that they, they have engaged in. They are, uh, they're knowledgeable about because they've learned it by doing it. They haven't heard about it. They hear about, they see Mark doing it, but it's, it's, it fosters, you know, them to do things too. It, it, that's, that's what he kind of inspires. Okay, so the solution becomes subordinate to the process. And that will help keep inquiry alive and keep creative problem solving alive rather than just providing a solution. You see what I mean? So I hope you enjoy Mark. I'll, I'll leave that link live and, and, or you can find it and, um, and, and you'll probably watch more than you have time for. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Myra. I'll, I'll take the next. All right. Inspire purpose. 
Okay, one of the ways that you inspire purpose is try to tap in. Now, I focus this on students, but you know, they're learners. They're just in general learners. Tap into students' motivations to cultivate a sense of purpose. You know, what is motivating people? Are they trying to uh, help others? Are they trying to um, create something new? You know, the more you kind of know about your STEM uh, learners' um, motivations, the more you can kind of help them cultivate a sense of purpose. Okay, using engaging visuals can really, really help with this. This is something I've been trying in my own classroom uh, STEM outreach project, and that is showing the results of things like mathematical thinking, showing it as an art. You know, look at this, look at this technology. You know, it's photographed in a certain way, it looks like an art object, and really really extracting the kind of creativity of it. This can seem very counterintuitive, math and creativity, but they're actually very, very connected. I'll show you a video about that in a minute. Um, but showing the kind of creative results of mathematical thinking uh, can be a great way to enliven math. Math is such a hard subject for people. You know, we all know this, and it, it's a very um, common challenge. You know, it's just, it's challenging. And, and this can really give you a way to enliven it, probably uh, that will, that you'll have a little bit more traction, you know, with, with non-STEM STEM people. That will, that will probably help you a lot. Okay, visual, learners are typically, I mean, it's a huge majority. Um, most people are categorized. Okay, this is a kind of an old educational motif, um, but categorized as visual learners. Okay, I think it's something like 80% uh, of, of children are considered visual learners. So if you can help them visualize math, then that's going to and and as a and key into the creativity about it that's going to that's going to really spark their interest more so probably than than other things okay um uh i have a I have a really funny story a friend of mine teaches at a at a severely underserved um public school in virginia and he was telling me the other day that he got a hold of a, um, he, he wanted his students to go, he's trying to develop some kind of STEM program and he wanted his students to go to Google Earth. So, you know, Google Earth where you can move, you, it's like a, you can use a VR, it's, it's got VR capability if you have a headset, but you can also just look at it online. I don't think they even have, they don't have headsets obviously, but he had them go on and visit a couple of different places around the world. Maybe it was Rio de Janeiro, or maybe it was um, uh, Rome or something like that. He had them visit a couple of different cities uh, via Google Earth. And, um, and they, one, of, one of them kind of came out of the, um, one of the young people kind of, um, you know, when they when they stopped looking at it or watching it, they kind of came out and they said, "It's like as if COVID never happened." <laughs> and I thought that was so funny because it was literally like the 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 learners felt just transported, you know, in into into another world. And sometimes that visual input is is so powerful um, that it can really it can really change you know people's understanding of things and so the first question they asked when they when they stopped um, you know watching Google Earth or looking at it was how did I just get there you know like how did I just visit Rio de Janeiro or how did I just go to Rome and he goes well don't worry about it you know it's it's linear algebra but I'll just you know I'll teach you two later if you're interested and they're like what teach us linear algebra now, you know, and these were really young kids in, in, who would never be learning linear algebra, 
you know, maybe if they're lucky, they'll learn it in high school. But I thought that was so interesting because he just kind of teased it a little bit and said, yeah, it's just, it's basically just linear algebra. And, um, and, and that's how you get to Rome, you know, that's how you got to Rio. And um, so, so the visual can be really, really powerful. Okay, um, also the human purpose of technology, what human impact does this technology have? Young people are often very cued to think this way. Well, we're, SpaceX is going to Mars. Well, why are we going to Mars? You know, you can almost like see the thought bubble over their head. What is the purpose of this for humanity? Like, why is this, why is this important? You know, so having them, having them understand the larger purpose of certain technologies is, is re, can be really uh, impactful to their own understanding. All right, makes sense, purpose. All right, I'm gonna show you a beautiful work of art. Thank you, Myra. This is a wonderful resource, um, and I'm not sure if you all know about it, or, or Sarah, I even offer it to you. This is a good friend of mine, Janet Hubka. She founded uh, uh, an organization called Illisart, and isn't this the coolest picture? This is the coolest picture. It's called Neurons 2, and it, what they do at Illisart is they, they photograph uh, they go into labs, life sciences labs. This one in particular was a biotech lab where scientists are studying the genetics of the brain and they capture human cells, the beauty of human cells under the microscope. They do have a K through 12 program and they really focus on the art you know, the art of scientific discovery. And I think she's really onto something. I think this is really important. Oh, many people are aware of this. We tend to call it STEAM, you know, where you put art into STEM and it's called STEAM. Um, but this is somebody who's really putting it into action. And I think it's a, it's a great resource. I just think this picture, I grabbed it because I just think it's so striking. It's basically just two neurons firing so it's very neat okay so that's an example you know coincidentally i also read this morning this was on the news this morning actually um that a a, a well-known artist has just completed a something called portraits of a mind portraits of a mind and it's hand painted 40 paintings of the digital code of Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin, very, very complex code. And he basically painted the whole, hand painted on 40 different canvases. That's how much code is in, drives Bitcoin and painted it. And that's, that's a great work of art all of a sudden. So that's really interesting. Um, there also is a local exhibit um, at a gallery in LA that I was reading about where all the art that's being exhibited was created by AI. And I figured this out because I saw the, the ad for the exhibit and I thought, well, who's the artist? Who's the artist? And I kept trying to find out who the artist was and I, could, I couldn't find the artist's name. And then I was like, I guess I just will never know who did those amazing paintings. And then later they, you know, I, I dug through it and figured out that it was in fact AI, that they were in fact um, computer generated uh, artworks. So this is a really neat way to teach students math, uh, mathematical thinking, to kind of show them the art of it and link it to art. And um, it becomes very, very interesting and very, very um, engaging when they're able to look at images like this and to know what's, what it actually is. Okay, all right. Um, thank you so much, Myra, yep. And then finally, this last kind of key piece of well-being agency, I've given you the definition again here, it's develop the capacity to act independently and make choices free from certain structural constraints, things that we can't necessarily help or control. Um, things like our cultural background, our, our um, you know, um, our, 
socioeconomic status and the like, and that's that's often a barrier, you know, a barrier to access and a barrier to being able to explain and communicate STEM and share, you know, the benefits of, of STEM with others. So a couple of ways that you can explain concepts um, this way is empower people with language and, and other resources. But language is really, really important. Um, in, in the surface learning project I do in, in my classroom, um, it, everybody is, is uh, speaking Spanish, you know, that Spanish is their first language. And they talk so much about language acquisition. And obviously, it's so important, you know, to be able to learn in, in and trying to acquire a, a language at the same time is just, you know, really doubles up on, on, the, on the load there. Um, but it's, studies have shown that the best time to learn a new language is when you're little. Okay, so before 10 years old, you can learn language, expon any language, exponentially faster than you can learn uh, once you get over 18. I think the, the, the whole range is about, you know, zero to 18, but the sweet spot is about 10 years old, which is probably about third grade, right? Isn't it about third grade? Um, or no, fourth grade, fourth grade. Um, is is the optimal time to learn a new language and you can do it fast. So I recommend trying something a little different. We're, we're always sort of translating for people. You know, people in STEM are always kind of translating, like trying to, to say, well, this is what that means in your terms, or this is what that means. And, and I don't know, I, I've tried talking in the actually the language of STEM itself as if it's perfectly normal. And you'd be surprised at how quickly younger people pick it up, even if they don't know the full meaning of the term, which is very strange. But even if they don't know the full meaning of the term, they then develop understanding of it. But they're introduced, the faster, I, I think the faster they're introduced to the terminology, the better. And even if it's, they don't know what it is. They, you just, well, it's linear algebra. And as if that's perfectly normal, a perfectly normal thing to talk about. And language and language acquisition is extremely empowering. So this is just something I'm personally kind of think can work. Um, Sarah, you'll have to help me out with any research on that, but I, I think language in general is empowering and young people are primed to acquire new language, whatever the letters are, whatever it is. Okay, and then also empowering with resources to create and to and shape technology, not just to consume it or use it. We want to share the broader, uh, you know, aspects of STEM and not um, not just we we want people to to participate in it, not just to consume technology or use it or be you know uh, you know in in that sort of passive role. We want them to actually be able to create, direct, and and shape technology, develop it. Um, so this is there there are many organizations that do this. I've put. A, a one up on the next slide, which you've probably heard of, um, called Curiosity Machine. But it's the, the idea there is to empower with resources that are free, you know, just low, co uh, low cost, free resources to, to kind of engage, to, to broaden participation. Always empower technology with a human centered purpose. Never forget the human aspect of it. Technology is not something that's out there independent of humanity. It's obviously integral to humanity, and we need to always be aware of what its purpose is, and it needs to be human-centered. Technology is a human endeavor, okay? So that, if you understand that, then things can sort of move from, from there. All right, um, and Myra, I think I've got one more. I'll show you an example of this, and I'm going to share my own 
service learning um, project with you here. Um, this is the mission of the Curiosity Machine. Are people aware of this wonderful organization, the Curiosity Machine? Okay, this can be a good resource uh, for you. And their mission is to empower children and their families. I like that they engage the whole family to become leaders and innovators of the future. So what they're trying to do is, is really empower people to participate in and create technology. And then this is the mission of the service learning project that I have going in my own Writing 340 curriculum. And I've shared a couple of the outputs here. Uh, one of them is a slide created by three students. There's Amon, who I introduced earlier, Marion and Edgar. And they've put up a picture there of a Tesla and they've talked about the different aspects of engineering that are in that car. I can make these posters available to your group if it would be helpful, Myra, to you. And also, Sarah, I can make them available to you. These all become, I share them with the community partners that my students collaborate with during the semester, but I can, there, it's on a YouTube channel. It can certainly be something that groups like VIP, you know, use as resources, these posters or these slides that you can share and you can use as, as teaching and learning resources. Okay, and then um, I've also put up a little video with his permission of a student, um, a, a wonderful student, Jingyun Yang, and he here talks very eloquently about, even though he just learned the English language about two years ago, he talks so eloquently and so passionately about um, and so inspiringly about um, what sort of math and, and engineering and STEM has, um, how it's impacted him and how he became interested in it and, as, and developed a sustained interest um, in it and what he plans to do with that. So he really shares his own learning process. And I think this is really important. You all are in an optimal position, just like the students in participating in the service learning project in my class, in that you are mentors. Um, you are in fact near peer mentors if you're working with younger people. Um, Sarah taught me that term. <laughs> or maybe Katie, but from the K through 12 STEM Center, you know, there's of course a lot has been written, but near peer just means you don't have a wide age gap. You're fairly close in age and this can, this can accelerate and kind of optimize um, mentorship. Okay, so you can watch Jing Yun's little blurb when you have a chance. I don't, I think we probably don't have time during this session because I probably need to let people go, but watch it at your convenience. And then I will provide um, additional ones of these if people are interested um, through our, our own YouTube channel. Okay. So last slide, Myra, I want to thank everybody. Oh, there's Shin Yun. All right. But I want to thank you all so much. Um, knowing more about your organization and what you're doing has actually made an impact on me. And I'm happy to help you. I, like I said, I will share resources, um, follow up with more. You're welcome to email me, Myra. You can, you're welcome to share my email if they don't already have it. Um, and I really want to do more to help your organization. I think it's wonderful what you're doing. And from all of us at the team here, and really myself and all of us at Viterbi, thank you so much for making an impact. Thank you. And thanks for having me today. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Weiss. So thank you're you so much. welcome. <laughs> Any, any just final questions? Yeah, I'm sorry I talk so much. It's not like me. <laughs> any questions for me? All right. Well, where are you all headed next? What's your, what's your um, next kind of event that you have, you know, on the books for Viterbi Impact? Yeah, so... Um... 